Okay. Yeah. Uh, but we have different Indian accents from different parts of the country also. I mean, all the faculty members who taught you uh, by till now, all of them had different accents. Yeah, but mostly, mostly is this, mostly is the same. It's, it's the same. I think uh, I learned at University of Kerala, so it's, it's not much different. Cool. I, 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 I appreciate the fact that you find it all legible and proper. So we have uh, people who've joined us now. I think we can uh, begin. We've been a little delayed uh, because of some, I think, technical glitches or some confusions. Should we begin with the counseling session today? Are you people able to see the screens clearly? Yes, yes. Yes. Cool. It, it's clear. Uh, and as I told you, while I am presenting, I'll try and switch off the camera uh, so that the bandwidth and the internet connection doesn't interfere because there is audio and the camera and the screen. So sometimes it does get a little too much for the internet. So I'll just switch off the camera and let's think that it's a radio program or a podcast for all of us where we can all interact nicely and kind of do. Uh, were you able to go through the text material that we've given you, the study material, uh, friends? Yes, yes. So where did you see the different uh, chapters? Uh, Elena is here. Good morning, Elena. I don't know. Good morning or good evening at your part of the country. Good evening in my part. I think it's morning in yours, right? So we have Zayir, we have Gonwe, we have Elena, and we have Simon by now. If more people join, it would be really nice. And I would really appreciate if we can keep it interactive as it was for the last two classes. So today we'll try and do four hours of some marathon learning. And it's been a really nice experience for me also, because I also learned from your uh, experiences as uh, professionals. Let's come to. So last time um, we were able to do the regulatory frameworks, ethics, the need for ethics. And what we had started at unit five was an introduction to the Indian constitution. Now, I'm not really sure that why would you in your country want to know about Indian constitution, but I was trying to figure that out, that it really helps to know about different countries. Like I learned from your experiences and more or less we are ethically or regulatory, we are the same bodies, even if the laws do vary. But even the laws are based on, on the basic tenets of right and wrong. So even if there are different laws of countries, they would still be the, on the same lines. So maybe it is not that bad an idea of uh, learning other countries' constitutions also. We have one more person who has joined us, who has joined us now. Sayyid, I can see. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Okay, Abdullah has joined us. I think Abdullah was not there for the last two classes. Welcome, Abdullah. Thank you for joining. This is the third class, and we have two classes in consecution today. So if you were able to go to the study material, you would have noticed, as we did discuss in the last two classes also, we have tried to make the chapters or the units that we call them in now in a particular manner. We try to divide your unit into a structure where you get a hang of what we will be discussing in this unit. And then we go on to write in the first and the second person so that you do not feel your students of distance education and you feel as if there is a teacher interacting with you in a kind of a talk manner. And then we do take you through some check your progress and activities all through the lesson. And then we do give you feedback for check your progress, certain books for further reading, kind of a reading list if you want to go further in that area and some glossary of terms, some references. So that's kind of how the chapter is structured. You would know that by now. It's been months that you are into it. And today, by default, happens to be the last class. I would, again, welcome all your feedbacks on the speed, volume, pitch, and the kind of uh, teaching that we are doing with you. Because in the end, it is supposed to be a beneficial thing for all of us. So as I was saying, this is this unit or this block today, of which we have already covered one unit in the last class, unit six, seven, and eight today. I'll be very quick with them because these are particularly about the Indian laws. So this would be more of, uh, you know, no knowing what is happening in other parts of the world, apart from your own country. So I did discuss uh, the Indian constitution basics in the last class. 
Uh, do you remember certain things about our constitution? I talked to you about fundamental rights, duties, the director principles of state policy. How do we have concurrent lists for center and the state, the two houses of parliament, the lower and the upper house, which we call Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha in our local uh, terminology. Do you remember that from the last week, from the last Sunday discussions that we had? Where are all my vocal students? Simon, Gondway, Alina. It was really charming to learn from your experiences also. Yes. Do you remember some such things? Friends, switch on, uh, switch on your mics. Do tell me. Okay, to set the pace, let's go to unit six today. And I'll try and cover them very, very quickly. And I'll spend more time today in this four hours on something which is beneficial for all of us as a common thing. So media laws and constitutional frameworks of India, the structure of this unit we have actually uh, divided into. Uh, there is a particular, there is no media section in our Indian constitution. And I think in most of the constitutions of the world, there is no particular section pertaining to media or something. But from the basic laws, the fundamental rights, the fundamental duties, we try and infer some media laws. So there is this uh, fundamental right for Indian citizens, which is called freedom of speech and expression. Now, this kind of, we say, has the press freedom inculcated or inbuilt by default in it. So our Article 19, this is the unit structure. We'll discuss it when we go further. Our Article 19, which talks of this freedom of speech and expression, what are the limits for the uh, press freedom, the law of defamation, that we do have freedom of right in speech and expression, but this right has not to interfere with other people's rights. So I cannot be saying things which might be hurting other people's reputation. So what is the law of defamation, the kinds of defamations, the punishment for that? What are the journalistic defenses for this law of defamation? After all, being a journalist, one sometimes has to write against certain people. Does it actually mean uh, defamation or does it, does it mean coming out for the truth? So what are the journalistic defenses? There is a very, very archaic kind of an act, which is Official Secrets Act, which was uh, conceptualized in, 2000, in 1923. We'll discuss about that. And then we'll discuss about the contempt of legislature. What is contempt of legislature in some cases of that? So this is broadly the structure of this unit. Do you feel there is also a constitutional uh, freedom for speech and expression in your countries? Is there so? We have uh, Bishar joining us. Welcome, Bishar. Welcome to the class. Yes, friends, I would like to know, are there any certain provisions in your constitutions which talk of rights or freedom of expression? I would actually like to know, are there different uh, sections in your constitution about media? Are there any media regulatory frameworks in your constitutions? Yes, Malawi has one. We have uh, such regulations and the uh, policies to regulate the media and even to provide that. Uh, so do you, do you, you have a different section over there which talks of media regulation and media laws? Yes, we have uh, section 34, if not 36, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, that talk, great. That talks about that. that, yes. Yeah. Mm. Great. And any other country which has that? That, that's a real nice thing for all of us that Malawi does have a dedicated section for media laws and regulations. So in India, we don't have any such section. We are trying to kind of by default or infer the media uh, laws. Are you able to see the presentation, all of you? I'm just kind of confirming. Yes. OK, and we are recording this session now for your information, right? OK, uh, and you'll be able to view these recording sessions on the LMS. I don't know how useful it is to view the recorded sessions, because while we are interacting, it is another way. So anyway, which way? So in the previous unit, we did discuss of the Indian Constitution, and we said that it is the supreme law of the land. Whatever happens, it is above all the government, above the political parties, and this is the Constitution we adhere by. A judiciary passes judgments as per this Constitution. We also discussed some of the salient features of our Constitution, which I said is perhaps one of the longest constitutions or the documents of the world. And for media persons and organizations, the most important provisions in the Constitution of India are Article 19, Article 19A and 361A. So these are uh, the media kind of things here. I saw someone trying to join. Uh, OK. Alena Apollo, welcome to the class. Thanks for joining. 
So uh, in this uh, unit, we will, as I told you, try to see what are the media regulations. These are some of the learning outcomes which you will be able to see in your unit when you read it. So I come to freedom of speech and expression. While normally freedom of press means freedom to write, freedom to print or publish, whatever one likes anywhere, anytime, the fact is that in normal circumstances, it is seldom possible. I think you will all agree as media professionals or budding journalists or working uh, reporters that you might say that freedom of speech and expression means I can say, publish, write anything that I feel like, but it is seldom possible because we all live in a society where our freedoms do touch boundaries with other people's freedoms. So for any media person to be able to function to their fullest potential uh, and kind of in a satisfying scale, Total or complete freedom of speech and expression is actually a necessity. So media professionals usually say this is an argument that the film people give that uh, if you put curves or censorships on us, our creativity will be curtailed. The advertising professionals do say that. And the reporters say, if you do not allow me to publish freely and you kind of punish me, OK, I am harming this person's reputation or I'm intruding into this uh, person's privacy, how will I be able to function to my full potential? So the print media has some kind of inbuilt uh, you know, permanency, uh, permanency in their operations. Whatever is printed is usually, we say it is printed for eternity. And these days we can say whatever we are talking, if you're talking about it online, for example, this lecture, again, this would stay there for posterity if you record it and put it on the internet. So it would probably stay there till the internet exists. Similar things uh, we can say about the print media also. So therefore, we do sometimes feel that there have to be separate laws governing this print or uh, you know online media. But uh, ironically, they are not any in India. So we are trying to see them from the freedom of speech and expression. About the historical uh, thing, if I say one of the strongest reasons for freedom of press was actually given by John Milton in uh, Ari Pegeta uh, in his work. And then uh, we did have uh, join, uh, John Mill in his essay on liberty, uh, in which he did say, and they did advocate that there has to be a separate you know, freedom for the press. In US, we see that immediately after independence of the country, the freedom for press was acknowledged by a vital part of the American Bill uh, of the Rights. And the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights also recognized the freedom of press as a basic human right. However, in India, freedom of press has had a very uh, checkered kind of a history. As I did say, there is no separate section for the freedom of press. The ex Article 19 in the Indian Constitution does talk of speech and expression. This says that you have the freedom. So just briefly to give you an overview of the Article 19 before I get very boring with this. The Article 19 just uh, kind of says that you are free to assemble. If you do this peacefully without any arms or you are not trying to, you know, uh, have any risk to the security of the country or other communities. So you have the right to assemble peacefully. You can form associations or unions. You can move freely throughout the territory of India, or you can reside or settle anywhere in the country. You can practice any occupation, any trade, or any business. So this also by default covers press, that you can practice uh, you know, a profession of press, of journalism, of reporting. Sovereignty and integrity of the country are preserved. Till then, you can write anything, publish anything, print anything, or you can even online say things. In print media, you can say things. In electronic media, on broadcast media, in radio, in television, you can speak of things. But there are limits to this freedom of press, which says the sovereignty and integrity of my country should not be harmed. So there are certain limits. If I broadly talk of these limits, I think they would be same across all the countries, like I started my discussion by saying that I don't know how useful or how beneficial it is for you to know about India's freedom of speech and expression or India's regulations on fresh press. But then I did answer this on my own, saying that this is more or less the same across the countries. So even if you are a press person, there are certain limits on your freedom, which do say that by your writing or by your broadcast or by your publishing, the security of the state should not be compromised. The friendly relations with the no foreign states should not suffer. The public order should be maintained. So decency and morality in your writing has to be there. You should not uh, write anything which has contempt of court or defamation or incitement of an offense. So I should not instigate any offensive uh, you know, riots or 
communal kind of disharmony by writing things. Till then, my freedom is freedom if it does not interfere with these things. So there are certain limits or curves that are placed on these. So would you actually uh, come out now, friends, I would like to know from you, what do you think is, uh, you know, meant by the freedom of press? And what can be the limitations? Do you, do you agree that we have to limit the freedom of press also? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? As we say generally that press is the fourth estate of a democratic country or a democratic state. So this fourth pillar, do you agree that it needs certain kinds of curves like these, the limits? Or should it be just a free-flowing press? Please come out in the interaction and tell me about this. Maybe, like maybe let, let me start. Mind? Would you like to write in the chat box? How would you like to go about it? OK, maybe, let, let maybe uh, yes, you can start, of course. Yes, I uh, should start the borrowing. Um, also read. Rather than chat box, uh, Gonde, please use the mic and speak out. Yes, uh, am I audible? No, you are Hello? not audible. Please switch on your mic. Hello. We can't hear you. Can others hear down there? No, we can hear him. Abdullah, can you switch on your mic and please say things? I said Hello? we can hear him from. Can I be heard? Yeah, Gondi, we can hear you. Why can't I hear him in that case, if you can hear him? Am I audible? Yes, now you are audible to me also, yes. Ah, OK, all right. I was saying that uh, uh, it, it is uh, so apparent that uh, uh, the media has to be regulated. And uh, we need these. Uh, um, uh, regulations in terms of say the constitution and the what not because if we, we would just leave it uh to flow just like that and the, with the coming in of say technology and the, there are so many uh citizen journalists that are coming in who have not maybe uh been uh, trained or even given that uh, um journalistic skill or they do not have any other skill of uh, what a genesis is all about so mm -hmm. if you would just open it just like that, it will be chaos. Because if someone will just be waking up one day and the, uh, 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 thinking they are journalists, they'll be publishing, they'll be doing all sorts of things. So we really need the, uh, a regulation. But do you, uh, do you know, now let me play the devil's advocate and ask you, if I curb all these freedoms as a state, don't you think that it would be curbing, I mean, the right that the public has to know about things, that would be curbed. If there are things happening, why shouldn't I be allowed to report them as it is? No, re reporting, because the, um, all these things that we're doing as journalists, responsibility is uh, of paramount. Because uh, there would be some things there where, I mean, where do you draw the line? Because this is that uh, what we were discussing should be a week ago. Where do we draw the line when it comes to privacy? Because there are some things that uh, we shouldn't be, uh, we shouldn't go overboard because it uh, would be uh, trapping upon somebody's uh, rights if we do so. But uh, if you are responsible enough and uh, report in uh, such manners, I mean, uh, why not? If we, we are guided by the, those regulations and the, all those things. I mean, we wouldn't be uh, doing any harm. Mm -hmm. And it is not only the privacy. It is many, many other things. It is, like I said, the security of the country shouldn't be compromised, the neighborhood relations, and many, many other things. And now let us come to this defamation. Thank you for that input. And I, I would request all of you to kind of keep giving your input so that we don't have a one-way communication making this lecture boring. So very right, he's saying that we shouldn't be interfering into other people's privacy or my trying to bring things out as a journalist should not defame any other person, should not spoil their name, should not hurt them. So the first law in Indian constitution that I will discuss, kind of which is uh, regulated for the press also, and there are certain privileges that we do give journalists in this kind of law, is the law of defamation. Newspaper correspondents and reporters are often assigned to cover functions where well-known persons or political leaders are, you know, allowed, uh, are invited to speak.
Now, why writing their news stories? Media persons have to quote these people. It's a very, very normal thing. You know, if I go and cover a rally in which a political leader is making a speech, so for my news, I'll have to quote this person. And this is my day-to-day -day kind of journalistic assignment. And we are expected to report truthfully, accurately, objectively. These are the basic human, global, uh, ethical values that we are expected to adhere to. However, at times what happens is that some of the journalists might temper with the writing. They might be just tempted to write uh, certain things which have occurred or me to perceive them in a different manner, cast uh, allegations on the speaker or the interviewee, uh, where, you know, the person's prime motive might just be to have a breaking news, just to have a spicy news. Now, this might harm the person's reputation. So this is called defamation. In normal life, we do know if uh, we say things about certain person which are not true and this harm the person's reputation, that this is defamation. So now what is what are the different kinds of defamations? Now, uh, we might amount to defamation to uh, impute anything. If there is a person who is no more, a deceased person, a person who has died, if the imputation will harm the person's reputation or the other persons who are living. So we are intended to be harmful to the feelings of this person's family. So there are times when a person is no more. And people do say, OK, now this, this scam is being unearthed and this person was responsible for this. So it can even be a defamation even if that person is not living. We may amount to defamation to make an imputive concerning company or an association. If I talk about any other company, not about an individual, then also it might be a defamation. Also, the form of an alternative on expressed ironically published broadcast. So it can result into defamation of things that are published, printed, in the print, in broadcast, in television. It might be about a person, about a political party, about a person living or dead, or even about your company. So no imputation is said to harm a person's reputation unless. Now you can't just say, OK, this she was trying to harm my reputation. There are certain things. There are certain laws about it. Unless it is directly or indirectly in the estimation of others, it lowers the moral or intellectual character of the person or it lowers the character of the person's caste. So in India, recently, there has been a big case where one political leader was booked in the law of defamation, where they say he talked about a whole community in a certain manner in his speech. So when you call uh, the per limited to a caste or a community or a particular, uh, you know, religion, then also it can be a defamation. If this is a true allegation, then it and also if it is in public good, then it should be made or published. So this is one defense that the journalists are given, that if this is in public good and if it is true, then maybe we will not consider this a defamation. There are other defenses which are given. They say if an opinion has been made in good faith or in conduct of a public servant who discharges his public duty, and this is in good faith, as far as you are not dissecting the person's conduct or character, then also we can say that this is not defamation. If any person who is uh, liable for public answering, if the person is a public servant, or if any publication is made which is substantially true, then also in the court, in the eyes of the court, this is not considered to be a defamation. If an opinion of a person of authority is either lawful or true, then it is not defamation. But if it is not true, it is harming a person's reputation, hurting a particular community or a company, then it amounts to defamation. Now, what kind of punishments the Indian law has for defamation? The law of defamation provides that if a person is proven to have committed an act of defamation, then this person will be punished with the, uh, either imprisonment for a certain term, which can extend up to two years, or with a certain fine, or even fine in money and the imprisonment also. However, the court actually reserves the right of avoiding such punishments. So the punishments are not same for any person amounting to defamation. These punishments do vary based upon what is the intent or the extent of this defamation. The law also provides that if a person or an organization is found to be selling or offering to sell any printed material that contains this defamatory uh, kind of matter, knowingly or unknowingly, then even that publication will be punished. Now, for you and me as media professionals, media practitioners or media students, this is important. The person, person making this defamation comment and the publication publishing it is also defamation. I would like to know from you that what are the different kinds of defamations in your country, if you are aware, or if you've gone through this study material, then you would know. And what kind of punishments are there in your country? Do you have any examples which are where it has happened? 
uh, if you would like to come out with certain things. Friends, I'm really scared to have this media ethics class where we're talking of particular Indian laws. So it would be interesting to know from you guys that law of defamation in your country, do you have, even if it is not the journalistic defamation, do you have any examples from your family, neighborhood, or your profession where people have been booked in the law of defamation? Abdullah, Elena, Gondway, Simon. We had three, four more people joining. Have they been logged out? In Malawi, we do. We do have defamation laws in Malawi. And uh, uh, we have had several cases of those in court. Good to know that. And in India, this defamation law, especially currently, is under a lot of news because one of the uh, members of parliament was booked under this law and punished under this law and he was asked to resign from a seat and there's a lot of uh, debate going on whether this was rightfully done whether it was wrong because laws are subject to interpretation everywhere so what are the journalistic defenses under this law of defamation is important in malaya in uganda in mauritius in india everywhere there's as a journalist if someone is trying to do certain uh, you know professional work now what kind of defenses will this person be liable to so let's now discuss some of these kinds of journalistic defenses. A uh, fair comment, a fair comment on any matter of public interest does not amount to defamation. Now, this again has a little issue. What is fair? What is public interest? This is again a definition that is subject to interpretation, definition which can keep on changing. So let's see privileges there are occasions when it will not amount to defamation if the report which is published in a newspaper is in public interest if it is it is considered a privilege a journalistic privilege that if you publish something which is in public interest then you will you can claim this defense against defamation if what you are publishing is truth and it is justified if you can prove it then again it is not defamation an unconditional, absolute, unqualified apology is sometimes accepted by the courts. If by uh, error or by in, in willfully or non-willingly, a journalist might have committed defamation, if this person gives an apology, the court might not publish, uh, punish the person. So for journalists, it is very, very important to know how to avoid defamation because of a profession as such that we will write, we will publish, we will say it is in the interest of the public. So. Uh, you must keep yourself well informed of certain cases and it is good to know you know in india the court of law when they give cases this is also considered to be law there are judgments by our supreme court and the lower courts which are higher courts uh, high courts and session courts such judgments come to your rescue when there is a case that you might be fighting in the court of law in any uh, reasonable kind of uh, defense so how to avoid defenses, how to avoid defamations? There are certain things you must always confirm and verify the facts whenever you are, even if you have the pressure of deadlines. There's an advice that we would give you, please verify your facts, please confirm your facts, what is true, what can be proven if you are asked to prove it. You must make sure that your opinions should not be uh, you know, based on false data that someone has given you. Always indicate the source in a story. Keep, uh, you know, self-promoters, self-servers at an arm's length who might just give you information for their own good. Always get the other side of the story, particularly if it is about defamation of a person. If you are trying to publish things, you must always get it. Keep yourself updated with the story. Keep a vigilant eye on the rivals, what they are publishing. Are you trying to write or publish something which your rival media is not? Then you need to doubly check and verify this kind of a story. Right? So this uh, is a very, very broad thing. Now, there is an important act in the Indian Constitution, which I would just like to touch upon briefly, which is Official Secrets Act. Now, this is a very old act. It was enacted when India was a British colony, which is 1923. Why do we need Official Secrets Act even today is a question that many media professionals do ask. What are the major criticism under this act? You might also be asked this kind of a question in your exam. Why do we need this kind of a act? 
Now, the answer is that Official Secrets Act means that there is certain information which the government can deny to give to you as a journalist when they say this is in defense of a country's security or safety, where this is for the peace and harmony of the country, then you can be denied that information officially. Therefore, I think in your countries also, there would be certain acts where the journalists are not allowed to extract that kind of information. Now, there are certain contempts of legislatures where you might you know, talk about against the state, against the government, against the ruling party or a ruling uh, king of your country. So according to the constitution itself, there are certain privileges which are enjoyed by the state. So, for example, in the British uh, House of Commons or in the Indian Parliament, there are certain contempts of legislatures which the legislature can deny the information under Official Secrets Act and certain contempts which you're not allowed to. Now, what is the contempt of legislature to be very clear? Breach of privileges of either houses of the center or the state state legislature is usually protected uh, under this kind of uh, privilege. While no distinct or clear-cut laws have been enacted so far in the Indian constitution uh, particularly, precisely these acts are covered under act one article in the Indian constitution, which is article 194 and article 105, which lays down certain privileges for the legislature that you can't talk about the law governing bodies of the country. You have to report the proceedings of the houses of parliament, but keeping certain laws in mind where you do not do the contempt of these. Now, there have been certain cases of contempts of legislatures in India. I will not discuss these cases in detail. They are in your study material to look at. I would rather encourage you to look at certain cases in your own countries where the reporters have been booked by the courts of law for harming the reputation, not of an individual, but of the lawmaking or the bill enacting bodies of the country. So this chapter was just to give you a very broad idea that even the journalistic privileges are limited by certain acts, which is contempt of legislature, by defamation, contempt of court, and even the journalists have to actually try and keep a very, very prudent judgment on how and what they publish, what they write, what do they say online or in broadcast media. So all that is very, very important. Uh, uh, is this lecture getting boring? Do we change? Because I see some of the students have logged out and this doesn't seem to be a good thing. Did this make sense? Did, does, does it make sense to learn about the Indian constitution and how we try to protect our lawmaking bodies from the journalists if they might just cross the line? That, that, I mean, does it make sense to understand this with your country's perspective? Well, I think, I, I, I think uh, for me, I'm, I'm looking at this much uh, with the perspective of my country. Of course, in truth, I wouldn't be very much interested in Indian constitution because uh, maybe I won't have to deal with that anyway. But uh, I, I, I'm trying to look at this from the perspective of my country. And most of the things that we are talking about here, we, we have the same things in our country. It's, 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 it's the same. So it's still worth, um, uh, uh, worth listening to. Anyway. Thank you, Simon. This actually makes a lot of sense because as we were discussing in the previous classes also, there are certain things which are different for all of us, but at the same time, there are certain things which are uniform for all of us. And we are also governed by the international laws where some countries get together and make their laws, for example, the United Nations or uh, certain groups of countries. We have SAC countries, G G20 nations, certain laws, certain regulations, certain frameworks, certain ethics are kind of common for all of us. And you are very right. It is good to know about certain countries to put it in perspective with your own country. So as a journalist, what we wanted to kind of draw the point from this particular unit, and when you read this unit in detail in the course uh, that you've been provided with the study material, you will also see certain Indian examples given, which I have avoided discussing today, less to make it kind of very, very uh, you know, country specific. I don't want to do this in today's class. I would encourage you to think of certain examples from your own country. Ha have there been any ruling members of parliament or if you don't call it a parliament, whatever you call it in your part of the uh, world, have there been any ruling, uh, you know, members who have been booked under defamation? 
because in political rallies when people are trying to fight elections they do speak about their competitors they do say okay this person is not as good as i am my political party is better than this person does this amount to defamation I, i i just encourage you to kind of have these debates in your organizations what exactly can be a privilege that a journalist should and can claim what should be the uh, liberties that working reporters or journalists should get or any political person should get right this brings me to uh, the next unit which is unit number 7 of your block 2 i'll again do this quickly because in these uh, you know we supposed to be covering 10 minutes each unit today um, again so i'll not take much time on this just to uh, give ideas and kind of have this in a, a nice manner i hope you were able to see the screens now of unit 7 media laws and regulatory frameworks in india particularly so this unit has been divided into certain parts what what is the need for media laws and regulatory frameworks what are uh, now there are certain acts which of the indian act i'll just refer to them today for your benefit of uh, the international knowledge press and registrations of books act in india which uh, which is again a law which was before independence working journalists act which is a very path breaking act in india and i would want you to draw parallels from your country of such kind of acts press council of india which came into being in 1978 what were its objectives what what are its powers ombudsman need for ombudsman functions of ombudsman indian penal code and criminal procedures court what are these in india what are certain sections and some of the professional bodies that do take care of the regulatory frameworks in media i would like to discuss them with you uh, in these next 5 uh, 10 minutes uh, the media are expected to serve the society efficiently and of course effectively in areas such as social awareness educational development cultural uh, and political empowerment we all have the same kind of functions across the world why do we call media the fourth estate the fourth pillar the parallel kind of a democratic framework because media is supposed to not take things lying down it is supposed to work for the betterment of the society for the development of the society in the economic educational cultural social political areas therefore the view of this uh, with the view of discharging these functions and fulfilling national aspirations it becomes imperative for mass media establishments to ensure that they perform their duties within the law of the land whatever the laws of my country you know i my country might be a democracy or a, a military a rule or it might be a king or kind of a royal ruling country so the laws would differ a little in this unit we shall discuss the legal obligations and regulatory frameworks which are prescribed by the government and professional bodies for journalists in india particularly for the media people right so we would focus on the learning of uh, working journalists act press council of india and registration of books act before that i would like to know from you why is the need for laws and regulatory framework why should the media persons be familiar with these laws i mean if i am a media person should my responsibility not be just to cover the events and report them my organization can keep certain different lawyers as a media person why should i only know the laws isn't it a uh, extra expectation from a media person the lawyers can know the laws and the journalists can know the journalism why do you think that journalists should also know the laws i guess i'm um um what about enough yes you are thank you Yeah, it it is it is it is important for a media uh, personnel to uh, have knowledge of uh, the law because it, it, it will help you to know your boundaries where uh, where and how to handle uh, stories because you've just been talking about the uh, issues of defamation here and the, so many other issues that may be uh harmful to others and even to the country at large so you you need to understand and have knowledge of uh, the law it's very important thank you gonbi but let me be the devil's advocate here and let me ask you a doctor is supposed to know only the medicine right um if i say that uh, any other profession a cobbler is supposed to know how to make shoes and journalists law, there are lawyers to know the law i mean i can give a story and my let my organization take it to the lawyers 
let them appoint lawyers and know whether they want to publish this story or not. Is it lawful? Is it unlawful? Why put extra burden on me as a journalist? A teacher is supposed to teach. A doctor is supposed to practice medicine. A journalist is supposed to just report. A lawyer should be knowing the laws. No, no, I don't. I don't. I, I, I don't think we would approach it from that way. Um, see, if uh, uh, ideally, if we look at uh, uh, many of the professions that we have, like even medicine or journalism or what, mm -hmm. we are supposed to know uh, how to conduct ourselves right. If we could use that word right, and that of course presupposes that we should know at least the basics of how we should do that. As a journalist, I'm not expected to know what uh, what exact law appears at what section. That is for a lawyer. But I am supposed mm -hmm. at least to know that I am not supposed to report something that defames another person. This is just basic um, uh, basic uh, knowledge for me to conduct myself well. Otherwise, the, of course, the the whole detail of the of, of the law is handled by the lawyer. But I must know what is right in that context what is right what is going overboard what is uh, conducting myself within my limits that is a must thank you Simon and godway i think uh, that did trigger an argument and we all agree that we should know the basics even if not in detail i might not be a practicing lawyer but to know my limits thank you both of you for your inputs it did make sense so now i am a little relieved that teaching this to you uh this thing is making sense and we are not being burdened with certain different professional acumens, right? Ooh, great. With those inputs, let me now take the liberty also of taking you through three or four certain Indian laws. And I would be really glad if you can uh, tell me by drawing parallels from your country where you have such kind of acts. Now, earlier, the print media used to be the main media. Even today, it is with the coming of many other media still. So there was a very important uh, thing, which is Press and Registrations of Books Act in, 19, in 1867. So India got its independence in 1947. 80 years before that, the British government did enact this uh, act. And it was actually enacted to control the printing press for retaining copies of works and registration of such works that consists of news that is printed in India. This was more or less uh, an act which wanted to keep records so that any uh, book which is published or any printed material which is published, it should be registered and the copy should be deposited to the registrar's office so that a copy is retained in a particular library. This act provides that all books and period periodicals that are printed in India should actually be printed clearly legibly and they should contain the details of the printer and publisher even the place on which they are being published now why is it important this is important because i can't just be putting a book out in the market and defaming someone or instigating communal rights and nobody would be able to trace me out so my book to be published or to be going out in the market it has to be registered so that if i have to be called upon if this book needs a ban or this writer needs to be told to you know do certain changes they should be able to trace the writer. Now, because this is a very old act, but it was still being followed because, because it is a good practice to keep a record. In 2010, the parliament in India enacted uh, uh, an amendment to this act and where they inserted the addition of newspapers using internet to give legal recognition to the orders of executive dealings with foreign direct investments. So what happened, there is a lot of online newspapers that did come into me and a lot of FDI, which is foreign direct investments into the print media. So even those things had to be encompassed in this act. So in 2010, we did have an amendment of this old act, which was Press and Registrations of Books Act. And we included the online and the FDI sponsored kind of a print material. Now, why is the Press and Registration of Books act enacted as i told you it was enacted so that a record is kept and why this legislation was not done away with you know as a student i was very curious to know that such an old archaic kind of an act why didn't we do away with this so that the press has a complete freedom so my teachers told me and then i did read and i understood that 
to avoid a total anarchy to be able to trace any printed material to its author to its publisher this act is very 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 important are there certain acts in your country where we can draw parallels with this act are you also supposed to register before you publish any printed material be it newspapers or books or novels or magazines or is it a very unique indian act well you are still students of media so i don't expect you to know it all of course as citizens you would know some things so i would encourage you to kind of research and search what are the parallel acts in your country about this and you know in your exams if we ask you questions about these indian acts it would really uh, get you good marks or get you better scores if you can write off simultaneous or corresponding acts from your country another very very important act that i can't avoid discussing and which is a part of your unit also is the working journalists act of 1955 why was a working journalists act needed in india is journalism is not a profession that is governed by certain bodies you know people started becoming writers and authors and journalists out of their own free wish and their passion so some of the journalists were underpaid there were no working hours for the journalists there were no regulations you know putting their service conditions at a good the journalists don't have a medical compensation if they die in the war zone the journalists are not covered by life insurance the journalists might just be working for 18 18 hours in the field because they're passionate so certain think was felt necessary in 1955 that certain basic working conditions for journalists are needed so the working journalists act which in total the name is the working journalists and other newspaper employees conditions of service and miscellaneous provisions act in 1955 we had this act enacted on 20th of december an act to regulate certain conditions of service of working journalists and other people who are employed in newspaper establishments in the printing press sometimes it's dangerous they are working with inks they are working with even heavy machinery they might get physically uh, you 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 know they might just get physically injured there are journalists who are working in war zones there are investigative journalists who are going to certain uh, very very dangerous places so the journalists might just face such dangers so where we were enacting all kinds of regulations on journalists we are telling them okay you can't defame a person you can't intrude into privacy you can't have this you can't. we were not giving them any privileges so this act of 1955 in india did bring in certain privileges for the journalists it did fix the minimum wages the minimum working hours the minimum uh, you know conditions of service for the journalists otherwise earlier you would see india being a developing nation a poor nation who just gained its independence usually the journalists were a exploited kind of a community so this act did bring certain privileges for them or certain respectable working conditions for the journalists i'll open the floor for discussion there i would like to know that in your country what are similar kind of are there similar kind of uh, acts which do protect the journalists working conditions the another important thing that i would like to discuss with you today is the press council of india on one of the recommendations of the first press commission so there were there have been two press commissions in india the first press commission did recommend amongst many other things the having a press council in india to set up a press council the press council of india was set up uh, it was actually the act was enacted in 1965 and then in 78 finally the press council came into existence I'm sorry the law requires that the chairman of the press council is nominated by a three person committee who constitutes the chairman of the rajya sabha the speaker of the lok sabha and a person who is elected by the press council of india so these are our uh, legislative bodies so these are stronger people who are actually chairing the press council of india and the press council actually it did uh, you know it came into being to protect the interests of the journalist and also to have certain curbs on the journalist so it is kind of a monitoring body which looks at it that the journalist should have fair working conditions and on the same time they should not use the liberties and freedom in a certain wrong manner the objectives and functions of press council just to give you an overview in the press council of india act a number of functions have been assigned to the press council however two of the most important objectives of the press council of india are to protect the press freedom and to maintain and improve the standards of the press 
in this respect the council kind of uh, educates the complaints of the journalists for protecting the press freedom whenever a journalist might come to the press council and say okay my working conditions are compromised i am suffering so they might take the journalists interest into consideration they also have in addition to taking in consideration the interest of the journalists they also have the power to censor there is a demand for setting up a media council where there has to be a power to censor see press council in india does not have any legislative or judicial powers so whenever they say things sometimes you know we refer the press council as a tiger with paper teeth so they're saying unless they have certain judicial powers of punishing people of imprisoning them or putting any fines they kind of are not having much of the control so this is about the press council these days there is a lot of demand of having a media council where they say that the media council in india should actually be invested with more powers so press council does not have these powers so where they do say that the media council should have powers to punish people so that the journalists are more protected i would come to ombudsman we all have certain things the modern use of the term ombudsman began in sweden with appointment of the swedish parliamentary ombudsman for the government uh in india this ombudsman has been appointed in banking and insurance sectors not particularly in the media section and uh, it actually recommends appropriate remedies or responses to clarify news reports there is a need for ombudsman the establishment of the institutions of ombudsman is favored by media organizations they feel that even in media we should have regulatory bodies so for now it is only existing in the financial kind of bodies in india so it is kind of a feature of self regulation so there is sometimes they say okay in self regulation ombudsman is covered sometimes there is a call where people do feel that a separate body is needed so strongly it is believed that effective ombudsman should be viewed by both management and the public representatives of the community so there are certain functions which need to be assigned to it also we will discuss how is this in your country i'll just briefly tell you about the indian penal code and the criminal procedure code which we call ipc and cpc in india certain criminal acts are being governed by criminal code of uh, law and if there are civil uh, kind of crimes we can say or civil uh, things in the law they are governed by ipc besides that the, there are the certain authorities everywhere in the world which uh, you know make sure that there are sufficient legal devices to proceed against those who defy specific laws so apart from the uh, code of conduct there are laws so writing or publishing or selling certain sedition material comes under the indian penal code act so whenever you do certain things which are against the laws of the country you can be booked under ipc or cpc there are certain sections which i will not go in detail these are in your books to read because details of the indian sections of law will not be much useful for your understanding unless you are wanting to practice as a journalist in india then we can discuss that in detail right there are certain professional bodies which do look into uh, these uh, regulatories and laws and also the rights of the journalist uh there are credible bodies like all india newspaper edition uh there are uh, newspaper societies of india that it is guild of india which do look into these uh so this unit broadly deals with certain of the ipc and cpc laws in india the law of uh, the journalistic act the indian press council or uh, and also the registration of books act which covers the print media more or less so if you read this unit in detail this is broadly what you can expect from this unit did this make sense i tried to be very quick with this one because this is very specific to the indian law so uh, uh please tell me are there any uh acts in the parliament or in your judicial system that do protect the journalists rather than just only putting the curbs on them a lot of there is a lot of talk about what the journalists should do but are there in your country certain equivalents to the working journalists act of india where certain insurance policies certain privileges for the journalist are decided upon in malay in mauritius yes, in different countries 
Hello, am, am I audible enough? Yes, you are. Thank you for coming up, please. Okay, speak. now in Uganda. Okay, so now in Uganda, there is the 1995 Constitution. And um, for it, it states, it actually says the freedom of the media and expression is, is expressly provided for in this very Constitution. That is Article 291. And mm -hmm. it says every person shall have the right to freedom of speech and expression, which shall include freedom of the press and other media. Now that is contained in the 1995 constitution of the Republic of Uganda. But then we also have regu regulatory um, bodies like Uganda Communications Commission and then Uganda Media Council. And these ones are specifically deal with regulation of activities in in various media entities in Uganda, you know, they control everything ranging from the programming and uh, I, the operations of media in general. Okay, so is Ugandan constitution as young as 1995 or is it an amended constitution? Is it the first time the constitution was uh, made in your country? Uh, this one uh, was amended. I think there was an earlier one, which I don't remember the date, but this one was amended, the 1995 Constitution. Okay, that, that's good to know. Uh, thank you, Lena, for your co comment. Actually, you know, this is very, very necessary to kind of, because in India, what we see, journalist kind of has a power of destroying anybody's or any organization's reputation or maybe instigating anything because if i say something and if i hold a kind of a reputation as an organization that this is a good news channel i'm an anchor on that news channel if i say something against anyone it would impact the public opinion of course the public believes in the journalists the public associates certain trust in these media persons so therefore it becomes imperative kind of to curb what they are able to say to gatekeep and this gatekeeping is done by the law Ironically, in India, we don't have a section for media law, which in Malay constitution, I was told by our friend today, we have. But also, I would like to know, are there certain laws to defend the journalist in your country? Something that says, okay, this is the minimum wages a journalist can have. This is the protection for the life of a journalist. Because, of course, this is a risky profession. If you are trying to unearth the truth, unearthing of the truth can be at the risk that there are many journalists who go to the war zone and they report from there. They might just get killed. Or if they've said something against a powerful person, a gangster or a political leader, they again might get killed. Or they might get life-threatening um, you know, calls. So are there any uh, things to protect the journalist? We've been talking of regulating the journalism profession, of course. But something to protect the professional journalism? Hello? Yes, you're audible. Yes, uh, as for Malawi, we don't have uh, a, a specific law that uh, I would say that uh, this is what uh, uh, a journalist would be protected if he say he is in trouble or something else. We we don't have a specific law, but uh, we have um, say general uh, laws that maybe would be uh, they would they would somehow. Uh, protected journalists, but uh, we don't have a specific ones. I mean, uh, that uh, maybe this is what uh, basically I would say we don't have such. Do you think there is a need for such laws? Just give me your personal opinion. I mean, of course, it there, there is need, there is need to have such laws because uh, um, we are now living in a world where you know you, you were talking about the politicians at some point, politicians would want to just you know. Uh, drag you this uh, left, right, and center. And uh, if uh, you are not as protected, sometimes politicians would do, use the same to, you know, uh, do whatever they want with the, the media, with the a specific journalist, just because they, they know that they are not as uh, protected. So I, I would think if he, they, they would be uh, that chance that maybe government or even a parliament to come up with the specific laws just to protect journalists that that, that would be okay cool 
Thank you so much for your input. I think I feel the same. And with therefore, the Working Journalists Act, when it did come in 1955 and uh, with its subsequent amendments, I feel it is very, very necessary because journalism in one way is also a risky profession, trying to, as I said, unearth certain truths, unearth scams, these might be financial scams, these might be, but there are many things that happen in a country, a lot of crime happens. So crime, you're dealing with goons, with gangsters, with criminals. If they have done a certain crime, you need to be protected so that you can report about them. Otherwise, as humans, we why would we want to do that? And if you're scared for your life or the life of your family, or if you're scared for certain things, you need to feel that there is a law of my country which is also protecting me. Of course, that protection should not be as much to give you a free hand to harm anyone, but as others are humans to be protected against your journalistic powers, so are you as a journalist to be protected against certain criminal or civil kind of defamations, laws, risks of life. So I'm glad that we agree on this. I mean, uh, this just might be a personal opinion. Let me now come to the next thing. Yes, please, please. I would like to know your opinion also. Yeah, so, so, so I'm on here. So, um, of course, I'm not. I, I, I'm, I'm, no, I'm not a, a practicing media person, but I would like to ask Gondo. I know from Malawi there is a body that speaks a lot. Uh, that back, uh, speaks a lot about the welfare of journalists. I think there's Misa Malawi, which is. Uh, I think there's some section of the. Uh, they call this uh, media institute for Southern Africa or something like that. They they seem to uh, protect. Journalists, especially when they are involved in something else, they seem to be the mouthpiece of journalists. I, I just want to ask Gondo, Gondo is, has been in media, uh, uh, under what provisions or under what law does that media, Misa Malawi, uh, operate? Uh, is, is it a provision in our constitution or something else? Because they seem to be doing a very good job for the journalists. Uh, I think from what I hear as a, as, as a citizen anyway. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, apart from Ms. Malawi, we also have uh, a media council of Malawi, just as uh, maybe we have one in India. Mm -hmm. We have our local one, which is called Media Council of Malawi. Uh, yes, these two and the various other um, uh, media associations, they try to protect the uh, journalists in, 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 in case they are uh, in trouble. But uh, unfortunately, they are not as backed by, you know, a law of some sort or some kind. Otherwise, these are just efforts by uh, association, individual associations to try to protect the uh, uh, journalists. But uh, in any way, mm -hmm. uh, I think he became an auditor. Uh, you became un inaudible, Gondwe. We are not able to hear you anymore. But yes, thank you so much for your input and thank you for putting that question, I mean, because I think this is the beauty of learning from your peers. I mean, it's not limited to what I will tell you as a teacher from India. You are also free to ask questions from each other. Am I audible to all of you? Because we can't hear Gondwe. I, I doubt if I have lost the connection or am I audible? We, we can hear you. Yes, uh, I'm audible I, now. <laughs> yeah, you are audible now. Yes, you are. Yes, yes. <laughs> And thank yes. you for your input. Thank you. It did make a lot of sense that when you said you do have a media council in your part of the country, but it is the demands are there for giving it more power. Similar demands are emerging in India as well. Did you don't give powers by the law, by the constitution? Anybody will not have an, any body or association or a union which might try to do this. They will not be uh, regarded as powerful. Like I said, the Press Council of India is sometimes referred to as a tiger without teeth or tiger with, with paper teeth. So that means a powerless kind of an organization who has good intentions, but they don't have powers. So be, to be, become powerful, you know, to be able to enact things, that's of course, of course needed. So I'll uh, now come to certain uh, initiatives in media laws in India. As I did tell you that there are no separate constitutions. The screen might be visible to you now. With this brings me to the last unit of Block 2. Block one was about uh, the regulations, the laws, the need of regulations. The second one was about Indian laws specifically, in which we did discuss the constitution. We discussed certain particular laws and regulatory frameworks. Now, certain initiatives which have been uh, not there as a nascent stage of the 
constitution but with the demands of the changing demands of the culture and the society we've had these uh, certain initiatives to enact different media laws this uh, in this unit we shall discuss the issues of privacy we should deal with intellectual property rights contempt of court right to information and the code for television which is programming code advertising code electronic uh, media monitoring news broadcasting and certain such things so now these are when initially the constitution in india was executed in 1945 it was conceived in 51 it was brought to actually execution there are certain concepts which were nascent at that stage you would all agree with the coming of the online media the issue of or issue of privacy has become all the more pertinent so certain new initiatives which came on emerging which kind of emerged in this unit uh, we will have an overview of issues related to intrusion of privacy violation of ipr contempt of court and also highlight the right to information act now this act i'm particularly very proud of as an indian this is a very very brilliant act and i'll give you a very brief overview about it uh, the circumstances under this under which this act uh, was actually put to use when can it be withheld the protections for this act we shall examine through some case studies the application of existing certain laws and questions of implications of these laws now let me come to the issue of privacy which is global which is international which is as pertinent in malay or uganda or mauritius as it is in india the right against solitary confinement the right against hand cuffing now these are some of the rights you know uh, when india was fighting for its independence against the colonial rule so the people were of course thought to be the terror against the ruling uh, you know government so they were actually put to solitary confinements to break their will they were uh, put to certain laws so there are certain rights to this kind of privacy also that is this your privacy to be social when you are jailed even if for a crime do you need to be in the jail with certain other people because after all you might be a criminal i'm using you just as a hypothetical thing of explaining someone someone might be a criminal but they don't cease to be a human so their life is also social as much as it is private private so privacy earlier days had these major concerns and right against solitary confinement can a person claim this right i do not want to be put under solitary confinement and i need to be put even if i am you know uh, booked under a law as a criminal do i need to be put in a jail of social people the right against handcuffing do you need to be handcuffed or you can be arrested without that the lie right against delayed execution there is a famous saying justice denied is justice sorry justice delayed is justice denied so if there is a case against someone till you are proven guilty there is a media there are people around you your neighbors your organization who are still looking at you with an eye of this person might be guilty so if you are proven non guilty after 10 years does that bring back those 10 years of your life when you were living under this guilt of social pressure of being caught off as guilty you know so justice should be quick it should be immediate it should be soon it should it be delayed so is this a right that a person can claim the right to shelter the right against custodial death the right against public hanging so all this is there if i am in prison do i have a right for doctor's assistance if someone falls sick do they have this right so these are certain rights also which are the media has to be acting and media has to be really aware even if it's for the media people even if it's for other people other citizens of the country can and should media advocate these kinds of rights press council of india and the concept of privacy and you some of the norms for journalists that are given by press council of india in the right of privacy are things that are concerning a person's home family religion health sexuality personal life private affairs these are covered in the concept of privacy by the press council of india except when any of these matters become matters of public interest see the public is still thought to be paramount public is over and above a person as an individual 
But all this is imperatively discussed in PCI, which is Press Council of India. So this says a newspaper should not publish such matters of person without their consent, whether it is truthful or otherwise. The press should not invade the privacy of a person if the subject matter is not genuinely in public interest. I'll give you one basic example in India. So this uh, against the press, an individual is protected. If there are rape victims, the press is prohibited to publish their names or put their photographs. A person has a right to get their head covered if a police is arresting someone and the media comes up with cameras and the person can demand, they can ask the police, I want my head to be covered so that I'm not visible publicly. Why? Because still I'm proven guilty. Till then, I need my privacy to be protected. And India uh, has actually been respecting this very, very uh, vehemently. I'll give you one example in our country. There was a girl who, who was raped some around a decade back. And this rape was a very gruesome rape. It became a countrywide news while people were praying for that girl to survive. They were having candle marches. There was a you know public sentiment for this girl. But till this date, we were not told the name of the girl. She was named Nirbhaya. Nirbhaya meaning brave. Uh, you know, Nirbhaya meaning someone who is not scared. So a name, a hypothetical name was given to this girl. And this case in Indian judiciary, Indian law, in Indian history, in Indian uh, press is known by Nirbhaya rape case. And the real name of this girl was protected. The identity was protected. This right of privacy is given to all such victims. So acid attack victims, rape victims, molestation victims, all people being arrested by the police have this right of privacy of not being named in the press, not being shown their face or photographs or videos by the media. So this is one right that the citizens are granted. So are we not only talking of privileges of the press, but also privileges of people against press? The press should not invade the privacy of a person if the matter is not in larger public interest. Now, briefly discussing, again, jumping from one topic to another. In this unit, the next thing that you have is News Broadcasters Association and the concept of privacy. So there is a News Broadcasters Association which also looks at protecting the privacy of a journalist or of a subject, subject as an of a person on about whom you are reporting, even this broadcasters association, it's not lawfully governed, but again, it is one of the bodies, one of the associations, which again protects the people. Okay? So none of the TV or the radio channels are allowed to discern the identity of a person without their consent. Then we come to intellectual property rights. Uh, so there was these rights do come into the existence at the global scene from the first sales doctrine. The first sales doctrine means that once a work has been sold, the purchaser has a right thereafter to sell or distribute that particular copy. So as a writer, nobody can be saying, oh, I wrote this book, I gave it to my publisher, I still own the right to this book. No, the right, once you've written it and sold it. So this comes into play in, even in the educational institution. I'll give you one of the examples from Iganau, from the university from which you are studying this course and from a university for which I'm working. So in Iganau, we have this uh, beautiful practice of getting our course material written by different writers. So different educational um, teachers or in educational institutions or different media practitioners do contribute to this course material. So once we get this written, we get a copyright certificate from them and we give them a basic onradium or a payment for their work. After the payment has been made and they've given us a copyright certificate, this material becomes the copyright of Ignau. So there the intellectual property right is protected. Ignau is free to use this material further. For example, I'm making these presentations out of that written material that has been sent to all of you as students and as learners. So now this becomes Ignau's property right and I, as an Igru faculty, are making, I'm making my presentation out of that material. Or we can use that material to set up question papers. Or we can use this material to uh, put up assignments to our learners. Further still, I can use one unit from a course in Igno for another course in Igno Because this is now Igno's property and not the property of the writer. So we don't need to seek consent of the writer. Similarly, even in the press, 
if something has been written that becomes the copyright of that particular particular publisher or uh, periodical or magazine or newspaper and does not remain the right of the person now there are certain laws uh, for fair dealing where uh, it is said that any work can be reproduced if the material is used for non profit making uh, activities for cultural value such as education art science or certain things so many other things you would see as we did speak of uh, creative commons uh, earlier even in youtube you would see that there are uh, laws that protect certain material if it is being used for educational uh, purposes so if the material is used for commercial gain however it is not generally protected by this law the nature and content of the material will determine the extent to which it can be fairly used uh, or even the quantity of material whenever we do write educational or research articles or academic writing there is a certain percentage of plagiarism which is allowed it is sometimes 5 7 or 10 it can be 5 to 12 in different organizations so if i am quoting you then there is only certain number of words that i can quote from your writing or your speech otherwise it would be plagiarizing plagiarizing your kind of content so generally up to 200 words of text not more than uh, 5% of my entire writing is free to be quoted now i would like to have your views all this is very good to say right to intellectual property right copyright quoting plagiarism fair dealing in the age of internet how do you perceive it in the age of internet it is very very easy to look at certain material just press a control c and control v copy and paste and things can be copied from wikipedia from google from now these days from artificial intelligence softwares like chat gpt so do you think that these intellectual property rights copyrights they do hold certain value in the age of internet friends did you think it is relevant hello yes Yes, uh, I feel they are still relevant. Copyright laws are still relevant, uh, despite the fact that the technology is still advancing. And the, uh, I mean, there have been instances whereby some uh, documents are put online or on the internet, which have been encrypted, they have been protected to say you shouldn't say uh, copy them uh, anyhow. So I feel like the copyright is, is still relevant to this time. and we are actually glad you know more and more softwares are coming where you can catch such things earlier it was as if you think of 20 years back internet was so new even if i'm copying your essay how would you detect it so there were lesser means and ways to detect it we are glad that now we have advanced softwares which can pick up the content and actually establish if it has been copied from such and sources now all your plagiarism softwares in india the famous ones are turn it in or kunt or junul so all these can now actually very very accurately point out that this material has been picked up from which source which website which book or which speech so now you have more developments in this area now which is becoming possible to point out these picking up content so i'm glad that you say that it is relevant i would agree to you in this so fair dealing in the age of internet friends is possible with coming up of these areas now there is another thing uh, another indian act which i would just touch upon which is the contempt of court act which did come in 1971 it says that if somebody does a contempt of court as in if a judiciary has given a judgment even the press does not have a right to question it so in india judiciary remains the highest body above the legislature above the state above the government even above uh, you know any other law which is enacted so uh, these judicial judgments are supposed to be the paramount judgments and you can't con have a contempt of court you can't say things against it or you are liable for punishment these acts also did come up with this contempt of court was enacted in 1971 it had a beautiful amendment in 2006 we are providing for truth as a valid defense in contempt proceedings so you would say are judges not humans are the judges of courts they, they can't they flaw if a journalist is trying to write why should they be liable to punishments so this amendment of 2006 says that if what you are saying is true then of course you can even challenge the court of law 
However, there are certain problems in reporting subjudice matters. Subjudice matters means the matters which are still under the court of law. One reporter covers many courts, hence they may not be present in every court if there is a reporter who is covering the court proceedings. So sometimes they might just be relying on hearsay. Legal jargon is sometimes very, very difficult to interpret. So reporters might say certain other things. And also their confessions of crime before the media should not be accepted as admissible evidence to the court. If, if somebody says in front of the media, oh, I've committed this crime, can the media actually take it to the court and say, okay, in front of the camera, this person has committed uh, this, um, you know, recognition for their crime. So the, 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 there are certain problems in this that, uh, you know, uh, judicial observations cannot be reported always accurately. So, the, the, so there are many views to this. Should the court be the paramount body? Should you be allowed defenses as journalists, as journalists to report against courts? Can the media be allowed to run parallel trials? So I leave this to your judgments and to more uh, research and search and your uh, you know, comments on this. Uh, one beautiful act that I would like to talk about is the act of info right to information. Right to information act is based on the premise that in a democracy, you should actually be liable. A citizen should be uh, free to ask for any information from anybody. For example, before this information uh, act came into being, there were appointments being made. And people would just assume, you know, if uh, five of us are appearing for an interview, I might feel I was the best candidate, I was still not appointed, this was corruption. But today you have this right to information to ask the person who was appointed in my place, how many marks or score in the interview did that person attain? What was my score? So certain such uh, rights to information have now become possible where each citizen of India is put uh, into this review of this act where you can just pay a very, very minimal fee through very simple things like postal orders or bank drafts. And you can ask for information from any of the public bodies, information which is pertaining to appointments, appoint uh, pertaining to uh, medical records of any people, pertaining to police, pertaining to first information reports in the police stations or even uh, from the government bodies why this thing was made, if these contracts were given, these tenders were given, why were they given to certain parties? So this Right to Information Act is a very nice thing which has made the democracy in India more strong. It has strengthened the common citizen, I can say. So this act encourages information uh, seeking by the public. The disclosure of the information is mandatory for anybody who, from whom it is being sought. The disclosure would uh, should not lead to certain things like breach of parliament or uh, under the official secrets act, the government can deny this disclosure of information, but which is very, very real. So there's an uh, act to information on which we also have a full chapter where we'll discuss this act in detail, but this is it. And next, I would come to the code of television networks, uh, which has uh, programming and advertising code. Programming code says that you should not offend or uh, you should not compromise decency uh, while you are reporting things in television, you should not criticize the friendly neighboring countries or other countries with which your nation has friendly relations. And you should not attack any religious communities through visuals or by words. You should not contain any obscene, defamatory or false suggestions. You should not encourage or instigate violence. So these kinds of codes are there, the programming codes. And then there are certain advertising codes that say that, say that uh, the advertisements should not compromise on the decency, yet they should not be against the constitution of India. Uh, we shall discuss advertising codes separately in a unit, just to give you a basic thing that we do have broadcasting codes in India, which do govern the programs as well as the advertising. And then there is a very, very good thing in India, which is the electronic media monitoring center. Now, what happens? There are n number of channels, OTT platforms, uh, you know, sky channels, satellite channels. There is content on these channels. There can be abusive content. There can be stereotypical content. There can be violent content. So there is an electronic media monitoring center which reviews each and everything that goes out in public, whether they want to put censorship 
or they want to put certain warnings. For example, in India, if there is someone shown drinking alcohol or smoking tobacco, then there is a warning sign that appears that to tobacco smoking or alcohol is injurious to health and we do not encourage such things. If there are certain uh, scenes where certain abusive words are used or certain violent activities against women are shown, for example, beating of the women or slapping, then such, such uh, scenes are censored and they are cut before they are put to the public. So this, this electronic media uh, monitoring center looks at each content that comes out in public. There is another organization which is News Broadcast, uh, Broadcasting Standards Authority, which also had codes of ethics for news, what should be published, how should it be covered. You can look at these codes uh, in detail in your written material. Uh, these classes are just to give you an overview of these things. As a rule, uh, this news uh, broadcasting standards authority says that channels must not intrude on private lives or personal affairs of individuals unless there is a clearly established larger and identifiable public interest for such a broadcaster. So as we discussed earlier also, public interest is paramount. So there are certain codes of ethics which are still being followed, but unless they are in public good, they can be done. Otherwise, certain things are prohibited. So broadcasting content complaints council is there. Where as an individual, as a citizen, as an audience, we can complain to this uh, authority that these certain things were there on broadcasted by a certain channel or an OTT platform, which were against limits of decency or there was stereotypical content or there was against the religious sentiments of a certain uh, community. Right. To sum up, in this unit, we have uh, considered libel, privacy, copyright, contempt of court, certain right of information, which we shall discuss in detail later. And we've also explained the role of uh, electronic media monitoring center and certain other uh, you know, monitoring units that are functional in India. Do you have certain uh, monitoring uh, bodies in your country? Do you have programming codes? Do you have something like right to information in uh, in, uh, in our country? Because right of information is a very, very new act in India, which, as I said, has strengthened the democracy of India. So do, do you have such and such laws in your country? Please tell us. We have it in Malawi. We call it access to information B. Access, which is called access to information? Yes, we have within Mal right, right, right to information. We have we have something like that in Malawi. That's that's beautiful. That's good to know. And do you feel uh, strengthened as a citizen? Uh, have you ever put any uh, question under this Access to Information Act in Malawi? As an individual, have oh. you ever used it? Uh, not an, uh, not not me, but I know that uh, certain uh, uh, individuals have used that. I think we got that. Is it last year? If I'm not mistaken. But it uh -huh. has been used by uh, individuals from the public to ask for specific information, maybe basically to do with maybe corruption or something. So citizens can demand for information, and the uh, 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 the government or uh, they, they, they are bound to give that information. It's very important, I think. That, that's really, really good to know. And, you know, in India, we have something like right to information activism. So there are certain citizens who are, have dedicated their lives to kind of seek information wherever they feel something wrong has happened, some corrupt decisions might have been taken, and the public has a right to know them. They actually put these questions because these are so easy to put. This act has made it is so, uh, so I would again say easy for the citizens to seek such information. So there are many activists who are called right to information activists. They, wherever they see some something which demands a public uh, kind of information, they, they do seek it from the bodies and the bodies are liable to give it. And in India, we also have certain time frames in which a uh, government body is liable to provide this information. So with this, friends, we come to two blocks, which we have finished almost half the syllabus. I will, in, I think we have two hours plus today. We have this class till four, four hours of this class. Being a Sunday, will you be good to have these four hours of this class? Or would it be too much listening to me for these many hours?
just to give you an overview uh, I, I, you would have noticed that you this uh, syllabus of this course has been divided into four parts and the four parts are four blocks we have covered two of these blocks the first one second one today we covered the second one also so i'll just give you an overview before taking a break so that even you can have a five minute break i'll just tell you what we are we will be covering in the next uh, section of our class today so in block two we discussed indian constitution where we introduced you to the indian constitution then the media laws and constitutional frameworks then we discussed the regulatory frameworks for media laws and some of the initiatives the new initiatives in media laws in uh, the next block in the next two blocks what we shall be covering is the next block which is block three is on very specific laws the first one is on intellectual property rights which provides an overview of various aspects of ipr in india then there are copyright laws where we define the copyright and we describe the basic features of the copyright laws of India. Then we shall come to cyber laws, which acquaint you with the laws regulating the cyber space in India. And then the right to information, which, which we discussed just now. We shall describe the historical evolution of this right in India and explain the various provisions of this act, because this is one of the very important acts, as I said, in India. Then uh, we shall be finished with the block three, and we'll come to the last block of this uh, course, which is specifically to do with the persuasive media, which is advertising and public relations. We shall discuss in Unit 13 the advertising laws and ethics uh, to provide you a brief introduction of various Indian laws that govern advertising. Then we shall talk of the public relation ethics and laws. And then uh, this block has three units. In the last unit, I'll take you through certain case studies, if you are interested, from India about the advertising and public relations ethics and laws, which we might skip if you feel that there are cases specific to your country, we might discuss them. So we have two kind of blocks left. In first one, I'll take you through the IPR, copyright, cyber laws, and RTI of India, and in the second one, advertising and public relations laws and ethics. So I think I'll give you a break for five minutes unless it becomes too much of listening to uh, Dr. Padmini and you kind of have sleep uh, thanks. Uh, we should actually take a break. Uh, do, you, do, you, do you want to take a break? And we can get back after five minutes. It is uh, 3.52 in Indian timing and whatever timing in your uh, time. So we'll get back after five minutes over here. Do, do you think it's okay? Yes, we need a break. You need a break? Cool. 